And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal saying, do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the descent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ijalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of the heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. This is the word of the Lord. So I want to give you my plan up front, my approach, because we have a few chapters to go through. I think Darren's got like 10 chapters to cover next week. But so here's my approach for today is that I just want to kind of do a, a, a sort of a quick flyover chapters 10 through 12. And then we're going to wrap back around to come back and camp on that section from chapter 10 that Pastor Darren just read and really kind of unpack this big idea that the heart of the message is that the Lord fights for us. The Lord fights for us. And that's what we're going to camp on and draw the implications for our lives and uh, see what the Lord has for us. And as I was praying about this message, my prayer for myself, because like I said, I need this message. Uh, you need this message. My prayer for you is that through this time, you'll come away with a, with a growing and deepened confidence in the Lord and that he fights for you, and that you will be able to rest in the fact that he's involved in your struggle, whatever that may be, that he's intimately involved in your spiritual growth, and he's working for your good. That it's not all on your shoulders, that when you come away, you go, I know the Lord is for me in Christ, and he's fighting for me and for my good. So that's my hope and my prayer for you. As we work through this narrative, I, I, we always need to do a recap on where we are in the story. So, so far, we have seen Israel defeat the, the cities of Jericho and Ai. And we saw last week how the Gibeonites formed a peace treaty, an alliance with Israel. They deceived them. They formed this peace treaty because they were afraid of Israel and that Israel was going to destroy them. And so they deceived them. And, and now Israel, in a sense, is on their side of the Gibeonites. Now, the kings of the land of, of Canaan have heard what's going on. They've heard how Israel annihilated Jericho and the people of Ai. And now that the Gibeonites have formed an alliance with them, the, the kings of the land are freaking out. They're terrified because Gibeon was a powerful city, a powerful people. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 10, it says that um, all its men were warriors. And so they hear this and they're terrified. So, so one of the kings, the king of Jerusalem, a guy named Adonai Zedek, forms an alliance with this group of Canaanite kings or Amorite kings. The kind of Canaanites, kind of the broad, the broad term. Amorites, more the specific term. They say, hey, let's attack Gibeon because they're aligned with Israel. So look at verse 4. Come up to me and help me. This is Adonai Zedek saying it. And let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. So Gibeon calls on Joshua. Now we're in alliance, so you need to come help us now. And Israel says, okay, we're going to help you. The Lord promises Joshua victory over these Amorite kings, and then Israel defeats them. And this is what we're going to come back to. If you keep reading in chapter 10, you see that chapter 10 rec records and recounts Israel's conquest over southern Canaan. Then you get to chapter 11, it, it records their conquest of northern Canaan. And then you get to chapter 12, and the first part is actually a retelling of what's already happened in the history of Moses when Moses led Israel in victory against a couple of kings on the east side of the Jordan before they entered the promised land. And then the last part of chapter 12 is this sort of recounting of all the kings that Joshua and Israel have conquered in the land. Now, um, in one sense for Israel, like this is good news for them. They're rejoicing over this. This is a good thing as God is fulfilling his promise to give his people the land. But in another sense, if we're honest and wrestling with the text, these chapters of conquest are, are, have a dark side to them, a judgment side to them. So there's a lot of death and there's a lot of killing. And, there, and you see that as you read this repeated phrase 
uh, through the narrative, through these chapters, it says Joshua struck them with the edge of the sword. Whatever town they come from, Joshua struck them with the edge of the sword, and he devoted every person in it to destruction. So we discussed this and the difficulty of this um, back when we were in chapters 2 and 7. So I don't want to rehash everything, but I do want to recount just a couple of, uh, of important points. And the first is that this was a unique one-time period in history in which God commanded Israel as his agent of judgment to execute his judgment on the evil of a handful of people groups limited to the land of Canaan. So only in the land of Canaan. So this is his judgment against their wicked practices. These were a people of perverse practices who even offered their children as sacrifices to their gods. They, they burned their children alive in fire to offer and sacrifice to their gods. And so this is God's judgment on, the, on, on these people, limited to this land. Outside this land, Israel was called to be a light to the nations, to demonstrate what Yahweh the Lord is like to the nations around them, and to be at peace with them. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 20. That's the first consideration. The second consideration is that the church today is not ancient Israel, that nowhere are we commanded to repeat this. What are we, co- what are we called and commanded to do? We're called to take the good news of Jesus into all the nations and make disciples of all nations. So those are a couple of important considerations. Now, this conquest took about seven years altogether. So it wasn't like immediate. It wasn't just this force of destruction that just swept in. This was kind of a protracted, you know, taking of the land, about seven years. So what you read in a few chapters is a lot of time compressed into just a short number of pages in the Bible. Now, that's the quick flyover. And I want to circle back around to chapter 10 and really focus on this idea that God fights for his people. God fights for his people. Now, connected to this idea of God fighting for his people is this command to not fear. The two go together. God's fighting for you, so do not fear. So I've said this before in previous sermons as it's come up, but the most frequent command in the Bible is do not fear or do not be frightened or do not be afraid. Some variation of that truth, to not be afraid. In the book of Joshua, I've counted at least four times where God tells him not to be afraid. Now, Joshua 1.9 is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, probably, and for many people, their favorite This is what he says. The Lord says to Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Here it is. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, why would God need to say that to Joshua? Well, think about the the weight of his mission to lead this nation of Israel into a land with foreign armies that he says, you are going to take this promised land. You're going to dispossess these nations. You're going to go to battle. I mean, that's a heavy responsibility. He's going to take them in and fight for seven years to inherit the promised land. If I were in Joshua's shoes, I would have been like Moses. You remember Moses is calling and a number of the people that are called by God, they're like, why me? Not me. Send someone else. And so God knows I need to assure Joshua. I'm going to tell him not to be afraid. Why do we love Joshua 1.9? Probably because we know that we're so prone to fear, right? Just thinking about, just think about how many things that you can't control. How many things that you're concerned could cause you harm or your loved ones harm that you simply just can't control? We could make a long list of our fears, could we not, if we're honest? And so there's this repeated command from God in the scripture. Now, focusing specifically here, I'm just going to run through these because I think it's good to see this repeated thing in in the book of Joshua. The Lord calls Joshua to go up against the city of Ai. We already saw that. He says to Joshua in 8.1, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Here we are in chapter 10 when the Amorite kings come up against Gibeon. And Israel, and the Lord says in verse 8 of chapter 10, do not fear them. Keep reading into chapter 11, when Joshua is facing the kings of the north, the Lord says to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. So over and over. Now Joshua, if we look at him, we know he's a man of amazing faith and courage to do what he did. But we shouldn't think that being courageous means not being afraid. That's not what it means. We know that Joshua is not immune to fear. How do we know that? If Joshua were immune to fear just by nature of his, just by virtue of his disposition, God wouldn't say, don't be afraid. So even the, pres- the presence of, of the command to not be afraid indicates that Joshua himself was uh, subject to fear at times. And this is an important consideration because this reminds me that faith and courage isn't the absence of fear. See, we say, hey, Joshua, he's a man of faith. He's a man of courage. And the man of courage need to be told, needed to be told, be courageous. Don't be afraid. So, To be faithful and courageous isn't the absence of fear. Faith and courage is when you continue on and you press on and doing what God's called you to do even in the face of fear. Do you see that? That's an important thing because, and I say that because you might be fearing something right now. You might be fearful right now. It doesn't mean you're faithless. It means you're normal. It means you're human. This is a human condition. But God doesn't want to leave us in that condition. He wants us to trust in him in the face of fear because... 
And here's the primary reason given in, the, in these pages to not fear, because the Lord fights for us. Don't be afraid, because the Lord fights for his people. Let me show this to you again as I rip through some passages. Listen to these verses. Chapter 10, verse 14. The Lord fought for Israel. Chapter 10, verse 42. And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. That's just chapter 10. If you fast forward to the end of the book in chapter 23, Joshua says to Israel's leaders, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Go down a couple more verses in chapter 23, and he says to them, One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Do you see that? When you're reading the Bible, one of the ways that you can discover and hone in on the significance and the message the author is trying to communicate is if you find repeated phrases in a passage, or in, in this case, even in a book, right? So this is clearly a repeated phrase. This is a theme, a repeated theme in the book is that the Lord fights for his people. And that theme is even underscored by other areas of repetition in the text where this kind of this formula where the Lord says, I'm going to have you go up against this king and this people and then this king and this. And each time he says, I have given such and such into your hand. I've given such and such a king in this city into your hand over and over again. Six times I count it in the book of Joshua where the Lord does this. One of them is, for example, chapter 10, verse 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them. Why not? For I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So that's the big idea right there. Do you see it? It's this underscored theme of don't be afraid because the Lord fights for you. The evidence that he's fighting for you is that he's given them into your hand is what he's saying. Now, this is an important consideration, too. This was a promise for Joshua and Israel in their literal battle against the Canaanites. But what about us today in the church who are part of Jesus Christ? Can Christians legitimately say that God fights for them? Yes, we can. He absolutely does fight for us, but not in the sense of fighting against people. That is an important distinction that we have to make. We are not called to fight people. What are we called to do as followers of Jesus to do toward our enemies? To love them, not destroy them. Now, there's no conflict between that command to to love our enemies and what's happening in the Old Testament because God reserves the right to execute his judgment against sin. And that's what he does. And all of this judgment in the Old Testament is really foreshadowing the final and great day of judgment. But our calling today as God's people, if you are in Christ, is is not to fight people, but is to, if anything, fight for them. By loving them, by telling them about Jesus, by helping them trust and follow Jesus to make disciples. So there is no us versus them in the Christian life. There is spiritual battle, and we'll talk about that. But when we say that God fights for us, we're talking about God fighting for what's good for us. That he fights for our hearts to trust in him. God is fighting and working for our joy and our peace in him. He is fighting for us to become more like his son, Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, there is a spiritual battle that we are called to fight in. You see that in Ephesians chapter 6. And God is fighting for us in our spiritual battle against sin and the devil. Listen to Ephesians 6, 17. The Apostle Paul writes, tells us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So we're fighting, right? It's a sword. The word of God is, is likened to a sword in a spiritual battle. So we are fighting, but we are not fighting alone. How do we know that? Because it's, it's the sword of the spirit. It's what the spirit of God himself uses, right? And so we could say in our evangelism, and as we share the gospel with people, we are fighting against the devil who wants to blind people's eyes to the glory of God, who does do that. And we take the sword of the spirit. And, and when we are speaking the gospel, as we see in the gospel of John, Jesus says that when we are bearing witness, the spirit is bearing witness through us. So God is battling spiritual darkness through us. We're not passive, and we'll talk about that again, but, but we are active. He's fighting for us alongside us. Our growth in Christ's likeness is not all on us. It's not a, just a battle that we fight on our own to be like Christ and to become like Christ. God does not stand back from you and, and just evaluate you with hands off and, and is hoping that you just do really good and that, that he can be pleased with you rather than be just disappointed with you when you, when you screw it up as if he's detached. No, he is actually in the middle of our, what we call sanctification. He is in the middle of our growth in Christ's likeness. Philippians 2.13, Paul writes, it is God who works in you. God who works in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God's working in us, giving us both the desire and the power to be like Jesus Christ. So God is fighting for us, alongside us, with us, and for us, And the ultimate proof here, friends, is 
that God fights for us is that he gave his son Jesus for us. That is the ultimate proof that God fights for us, that God fights for his people. Like that is the, the ultimate, the ultimate proof. In Jesus' death and resurrection, he fought and conquered our sin and Satan and death. Like the biggest enemies of all. And he conquered them for our sake. Listen to the Apostle Paul's concluding argument in Romans 8. He writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, so all these trials and these difficulties, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So he is saying that God has proven by giving us his son for us that he's forever for us. Do you see that? If he gives his son for us, that's what more evidence do we need that God is for us, right? If he gives the ultimate gift, will he not give us, that's his point, will he not give us all the other things that we need when he says graciously give us all things? It means all that you need in life, God will supply to you. It's a greater to lesser argument. If he's already given this much, will he not give you the smaller things that you need through life, right? And so this phrase, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, conquerors, that's, that's battle language, literally means to be completely victorious. And so what he's saying here, when he says we are more than conquerors, that's a present tense verb. It's an ongoing action, which means that Christ is always fighting for our victory in the pain and hardships of life. It's ongoing. And, and how is this victory achieved? Through our own strength? You see the words there? Through him. Through him. Through him we are conquerors. Through his strength we're conquerors, not ours. So yes, absolutely. The Christian can say with full assurance, God is fighting for me. No matter what I'm going through, God is always working for my good. So we say yes and amen to that. But God fighting for us doesn't mean that we are passive or that we should or we can be passive. That's just not in the Bible. It's just not in the way of living with God. Look at chapter 10, verse 9. So Joshua, it says, came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. Now, God had promised to fight for Israel, right? So does he just say, well, you just hang out there and I'll take care of it all. No, they were called to, they still had to strap on their armor and and swing their swords. Like God's not going to swing the sword for them. He says, I'm fighting. So there's that paradox again of living life with God. When you learn to live your life in the strength and the power of another, not in passivity, but you are acting, but somehow God is acting through you and accomplishing victory. So that in the end, when there's victory, God says it was for me, not from you. It's just this ongoing thing. So we have to learn to, to live not passively, but actively trusting God doesn't mean passivity. It means activity in the strength of the Lord. And the Lord clearly demonstrates his strength on their behalf. Look at verse 10. And the Lord threw them into panic before Israel. The Lord did this. Who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon? The Lord's working on their behalf here. He's fighting for them. Verse 11. And as they fled before Israel while they were going down the descent of Beth Horon, the Lord uh, threw down large stones from heaven on them, hailstones, as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. So this is just an insane, crazy scene. The Lord is raining down from heaven these large hailstones that that are killing off the Amorite army. God is clearly fighting for his people. But notice that Joshua doesn't put his sword back in his sheath and say, well, guys, let's call it a day and just let the Lord take care of the rest of them with the hailstones. He doesn't call it a day. You know what he actually does? He asks for a longer day so they can defeat their enemies. Look at verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day. He spoke to the Lord. That's prayer. In the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? You guys know that, right? I learned that in kindergarten, didn't you? Of course we all know it's written in the book of Jashar, right? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man. There's prayer there, right? For the Lord fought for Israel. Now, this is one of the most famous miracles in the Bible because um, it's, just, it's just kind of astounding. And it was apparently written down in an extra, ancient extra biblical. When I say extra biblical, I mean outside of the Bible text called the book of Jashar, which appears to be a collection of poems or stories 
about Israel's heroes. Now, some readers, they come across this and they consider this passage to be in direct conflict or contradiction with scientific knowledge since we know that the earth orbits the sun, right? But the fact that the text says that the sun stood still doesn't bother me any more than when someone says the sun came out. I don't say, haven't you heard of Copernicus and Galileo? Don't you know that the earth orbits around the sun? I don't say that because I, just, I don't say, no, I don't, I don't say the sun doesn't come out. The clouds part. Because I know there's a way of speaking that's capturing what's happened that's not an attempt at scientific accuracy. So here's the deal. If you believe in a creator God, I'm not sure there should be any real stumbling block at any miracle story, whether it's this or it's the division of the loaves and the fish that Jesus does or it's his resurrection from the dead. If there's a creator God who reigns over the universe who does these things, then there's no problem for me believing that he could temporarily halt the earth's rotation and keep the world running smoothly in spite of that. It's just not a hang up for me. If you believe in a creator God, I would submit to you that it shouldn't be a hang up to you either. But some will read that and they'll be hung up on it. Now, this entire passage, this whole thing clearly shows us that God rules over the affairs of humankind. He absolutely governs the universe. You see that from the, the, the hailstones and even the handing over of the armies. God rules over everything. And this is good news to us. That God is in complete control. God's never surprised. His eyes are never closed. His back is never turned. His arms are never tied behind his back. He's never worried. He's never wondering what he should do next. Like in this season, I'm just like, we're in church leadership conversation. We never know what's coming next. And God always has, he always knows what he's doing. And that is absolutely good news to us. He is infinitely wise and powerful. He is infinitely wise and powerful, which is why the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 1.11 that he that is God works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things including hard and terrible things. God is somehow sovereign. We use the word in theology, sovereignty, his absolute control over all things. Now that doesn't mean that all things that happen are good. There are many things that happen in the world that are tragic and that are horribly evil. And we don't call evil good. We call evil evil. And somehow, in spite of that, God rules over all these things and can orchestrate all things to bring about his ultimate good plans in the world. Don't ask me to reconcile those things. I can't. The Bible doesn't explain to me. I just know that this is the revelation of God infinitely wise and powerful. Now, what's amazing is that when you take that infinite wisdom and power, it's, it's married to his infinite goodness, his infinite goodness, that his plans are good. And so we need to remember that the one fighting for us, whatever it is that you are battling, struggling with, whatever seems impossible to you, we need to remind ourselves that the one fighting for us is limitless in his wisdom and his power and that he is good. And Psalm 121 captures this when it says of the Lord, Behold, he who keeps Israel, preserves Israel, will neither slumber nor sleep. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Does worry ever keep you awake at night? I mean, in this season, I've had many nights where I wake up at 3 in the morning and I can't fall back asleep because my mind is going. And in the darkness, I'm just like spinning out. And then in the morning when the light comes, I'm like, why was I such a mess last night? Why was my worry keeping me up. And, and, and someone wisely said, we can sleep because the Lord never does. We can sleep because when you close your eyes, the Lord doesn't close his eyes. He doesn't stop watching over you. Now, again, this doesn't mean, friends, that, that he'll, pres- he'll keep us from all danger and from all pain, but our ultimate preservation in, in Christ is promised, as we just read about in Romans. Theology a professor of mine used to say the sovereignty of God is a soft pillow for a weary head. Like if you believe in the infinite power and wisdom of God married to his goodness, then you're okay. You don't have to worry. And this is just a lesson. I feel like I have these moments of, of revelation where I'm like, yes, Lord, and I feel that confidence. And then just ask me that tomorrow. And I'm back down here and I'm fighting for the confidence in God. He doesn't change. And so even when I'm low and I'm anxious and I'm fearful, I thank the Lord God that though I'm like this, he's just like this. He's unchanging in his stability toward his people. He's not without emotion. He's not without concern. I don't make him out to be this this static being. No, he's not. But in terms of his heart toward us and his commitment to us, he is stable. So regardless of my feelings of instability, God is an everlasting rock. 
He's an everlasting rock, and we can trust in him because he's sovereign. And we see his sovereignty at work here in this passage, but also that he exercises this sovereignty in response to prayer. Verse 14 says, The Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. This is talking about prayer. So, so here's how I'm distilling the, the truth from this that I see. One of the ways that God fights for his people is by answering their prayers. You see the connection between the Lord heeding the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So one of the ways in your life that God will fight for you is in answering your prayers. So again, not a life of passivity, but a life of engagement, bringing our hearts before the Lord, bringing our requests before the Lord, that he would hear us and answer us. And he's fighting for us in that process. So we are a part of the process where he fights for us in response to, to our prayers. And we have this promise that if we are in Christ, he hears our prayers and he will answer us. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Which is to say, friends, that God will not answer our prayers if we're praying things that aren't in line with his will. He will answer our prayers if we are praying in line with his will. Because God is wiser than we are. Joshua knew that it was the Lord's will to give them victory in this battle. So he prayed for something that would help give them victory. And God said yes. So what this means for us is that as we study the Bible, as we come to know God through reading the scripture, we get to know him. We get to know his heart, his priorities, his desires. And we pray for those things. Now, we may not know God's will in the specifics of, of, of the certain circumstances of our lives. He doesn't give us that level of detail. But on the whole, he has revealed who he, who he is, what he's like, and that's going to shape the, the ways that we pray. And as we pray for things God cares about, as we pray for God's priorities revealed in the scripture, God's going to answer us. He's going to answer us and fight for us in those things. When we pray in line with God's will, He's going to fight for us by answering our prayers. And it's like the Apostle Paul wants us to understand how great God is and give us greater confidence in prayer. So I'm taking a snippet of this sort of doxology, this moment of praise in Ephesians 3.20, when he says, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. That's prayer. Than all that we ask or think. So not just what we ask, but even the things that we can conceive of in our mind, God is greater than those things. Has God ever blown your mind? Has he ever blown your mind where you prayed for something, he did something so much greater than you ever thought would ever happen? Have you experienced that? It's amazing. You're like, I would have never thought of that. Yeah, you wouldn't because you're not God. But God can and God does. And Paul wants us to glorify God who's, who's, who can do abundantly beyond all that we ever ask or think. We may have no idea how God is going to fight for us and work things out for our good, but he can do much more than we even pray for. And if you're listening today, if you're online or you're here in the room today and you've, ne you've never committed to following Jesus, I would urge you today to make that decision, to make that commitment because this is good news. There's much to learn. There's much to enjoy. I'm not going to lay it all out now. Gosh, I could take way more time than I have here. Jesus is worth following. He is worth following. He's given his life. All these promises. Now, if God gave the life of his son, Jesus, for our eternity, what lengths will he not go to to fight for us today? Another greater to lesser argument. If he has secured eternity for us, if he's fought for our eternity and secured that, what will he not do for us in the present moment? That's Paul's point in Romans 8 again. If he's given us his son, if he's done this, what will he, then surely he will take care of us in the present and will fight for our good. So what are you facing? Where is your fear? I have my fears. I've been, it's like the Lord doesn't let me just preach this. He gave me plenty of reasons to, 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 to press into this text because he knew that my heart needed it. He knows that I need to learn the things that I'm about to open my mouth about. What are your impossible situations that you're facing? I can't promise you that God's going to work it out the way that you want him to work it out. But what I can promise you, because the promise is here, is that he's committed to your good and that he will fight for you. Where do you need to ask the Lord to fight for you? Ask him. Pray to him. We see that in the text. Don't fear. Trust him and act. Understand that he's acting through you and acting for you and acting with you in a sense. And we have this promise that through him, we are more than conquerors. Through all those things, the tribulations, trial, persecution, sword, famine, nakedness, hunger. 
Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. The Lord will fight for us from today until the day that we stand on him in his presence, until the final day. So from today until that glorious day, that final day, he's the one who is going to bring us there. Yes, we persevere, but yes, the Lord is working through us to bring us to that final day. When we get there before God's great and glorious throne, it's not because we were so strong and we fought so hard. It's because the Lord was working in us and fighting for us and bringing us there. And so I can't think of a better way to close this than just by reading this doxology at the end of Jude's letter. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, him, him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you uh, for this great promise. This great promise that uh, today you are fighting for your people, fighting for our good, to preserve us, to strengthen us, to grow us, God, to be like your, more like your son, Jesus Christ. We have this great promise that today you're fighting for us and that you will uh, stick with us and fight for us until the final day, God, that you present us blameless, Blameless, only because Jesus is cleansing by his death and resurrection for our sin. Blameless, before the presence of your glory and with great joy, Lord, with great joy. We thank you for this. Help us to trust. Help us to pray. Help us to act in dependency upon you and upon your great grace, Lord. And now, Jesus, to you be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.